now we have our third and final panel on Brexit. And the question that our extremely distinguished panel will be uh, discussing is what are the priorities for env environmental law after Brexit and what will the consequences mean for the UK? I will uh, quickly leave you um, and leave our moderator, Sean Spears, to introduce the other panellists, but I will quickly uh, introduce Sean himself. Um, in 1994, Sean was elected Labour member of the European Parliament for London South East and served on the Agriculture and Rural Development Committee. Sean was also Chief Executive of CPRE from 2004 to 2017. Currently, Sean is the Executive Director of the Environmental Think Tank, Green Alliance, and he is also, also Chair of Greener UK, a coalition of 12 environmental groups set up in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit referendum. He also has a book which was released in March 2018, published by Policy Press, called How to Build Houses and Save the Countryside. Sean, we're very grateful for you uh, being here and we're very much looking forward to the session. So I will now hand over to you. Great, many thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Still one or two copies of the book left, should anybody be interested. Uh, I'll introduce the, uh, the, the panelists in a moment. Um, looking forward to a really uh, enlightening session on the priorities of environmental law following Brexit. I think it's just worth saying uh, in, at the start from a greener, UK perspective that uh, we have found sort of interaction with lawyers an incredibly important part of the process of trying to get better environmental law following Brexit. As I'm sure everybody knows, the European Union and European law has been tremendously important in driving environmental progress in the, in the UK 40 years, or was incredibly important. Um, and, and we've had to play sort of catch up pretty quickly to get on top of what Professor Maria Lee of UCL and Caroline Abbott of Manchester University have called an anomalous, anomalously law-heavy process as regards the environment following Brexit. And, and they go on to say, uh, legal expertise is generally in short supply, poorly understood and underappreciated in the environment sector, and that Green UK and all the coalition members have had to make a priority of using legal expertise um, and that's meant not only pooling precious legal resources, but also deepening legal expertise by creating a space for reflection and deliberation and raising the profile of legal experts in environmental groups. And I think four years on from the referendum, uh, the environment movement as a whole is, is seeing the crucial importance of, of environmental law for uh, driving environmental progress. So I hope we'll have a really good discussion today. Um, I'm going to introduce each member of the, the uh, panel now briefly, and, and then we'll go on to 15 to 20 minute presentations, and we should have time for about half an hour discussion at the end. So the first speaker will be uh, Catherine Neal, the clean air lawyer for Client Earth, and I, and I guess the impact of the European Union on uh, law, law to protect air quality and, and the Client Earth use of that law has been very high profile and really crucial in, in recent years. So I look forward to hearing from Catherine. Then we'll have Professor Colin Reid of the University of Dundee. Uh, Colin is a member of the Scottish Government's Roundtable on Environment and Climate Change and an associate of Brexit and the Environment, the research network with which Green UKs work very closely. Uh, and Colin's going to talk about the devolved aspects of environmental law post-Brexit, a, a really uh, important area and one that I think is often not as well understood in England as in other parts of the, the UK, the extent to which environmental law is devolved. And then finally, uh, we have uh, Tom Burke. Tom is, among many other things, chair and founding director of E3G. He's um, got a CV as long as your arm, ex-director of Green Alliance, among many other things. And Tom is going to talk about the connections between law and politics. So um, that, that's, that's the, the agenda for the next hour and a half. Um, without further ado, can I introduce uh, Catherine to give you your presentation? Catherine. Right, I am hopefully now sharing my screen. Um, and yeah, it's saying start from the beginning, which is what I want to do. Okay, um, great. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, as you said, my name's Katie Neild and I'm a lawyer, a clean air lawyer at Client Earth. 
Um, I'm really grateful for being invited along today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here alongside uh, other panelists with such chunky and impressive CVs, so thank you. Um, in terms of what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna talk to you about what the UK has in store when it comes to the regulation of air quality, now that we've waved goodbye to the EU. Um, with first a bit of an introduction to what air pollution rules come or came from the European Union, then an explanation as to what's happened to those rules now that we've left, and finishing with a bit of an indication of what winds of change are blowing our way in that context. So I've got 15 to 20 minutes, so this is all going to have to be quite whistle stop, I'm afraid, but I really look forward to hopefully a good discussion after all of our presentations and also hearing from the other pan panellists. So before I start talking about air pollution, uh, just a very quick introduction to Client Earth for those of you who've not heard of us before. So we're an organisation that uses the law to do these things. I'm not going to read them off the slide. Um, uh, and we do these things in uh, these places. Um, so as an organisation, we work on a whole host of different environmental issues. Uh, but I'm a lawyer in the clean air team in the UK. So hopefully that explains the focus of my talk today. Um, so air pollution. Um, when it comes to the rules relating to what is in the air that we have to breathe, um, what do we have Europe to thank for? Well, there are two main chunks of legislation. Um, there's this directive known as the Ambient Air Quality Directive. Um, and there's this second directive uh, known as the National Emission Ceilings or NEC Directive. So these are pretty chunky pieces of legislation, um, but in an extremely high level summary uh, in terms of what these two pieces of law do. The Ambient Air Quality Directive requires that member states keep the amount of, the concentration of certain harmful pollutants measured in the air around us and the air that we breathe outside below set maximum threshold concentrations. And those are referred to as limit values. And where those values are exceeded, member states have actually got to do something about it. So they've got to ensure that plans or air quality plans are in place to get pollution to within legal limits in the shortest possible time. So that's the Ambient Air Quality Directive. The National Emission Ceiling Directive requires that member states reduce their total national emissions, so the kind of total volume of stuff that's getting um, chugged into the atmosphere, of five key air pollutants. And those reductions are specific percentages by reference to a 2005 baseline. And they kick in from 2020 and then ratcheting down uh, from 2030. And again, member states are required to put plans in place to make sure those emission reduction commitments are met. So sorry, we've had to get a bit heavy right from the beginning, but I think it's, I think it's good to set the context of the, what, what the rules are that we're talking about. Um, and so we've got one that covers concentrations, the air quality directive, and one that covers um, total emissions, the national emission ceilings directive. And the aim of both of these pieces of legislation unsurprisingly, uh, is to protect human health and the environment. That's why they're there, that's their purpose. And they of course sit alongside loads and loads and loads of other bits and pieces of legislation that regulate emissions from specific types of sources, so specific polluting industries or motor vehicles or industrial plants. But um, I'm sure you're breathing a bit of a sigh of relief that I'm not gonna be going into that level of detail today. Um, I want to save you that headache. So what happened to these overarching rules when the UK left the EU? Are they here to stay or have they gone for good? Well, for now, yes, they are kind of uh, still in force. So both those directives I was just talking about no longer have direct effect in the UK, but they had already been put into domestic law by these two instruments here. So the Air Quality Standards Regulations and the National Emission Ceilings Regulations 2018. Um, and both these sets of regulations remain in force and both identify the Secretary of State for the Environment as, as responsible for ensuring limit values are met 
and ensuring that emission reduction commitments are delivered. And these regulations are still part of domestic law. Their substance has not really changed to any significant degree as a result of Brexit. The limit values and the reduction commitments are still legally binding. So that sounds quite great, doesn't it? Um, but unfortunately, there are a few buts. It's not all excellent news. Um, so what are those buts? What do we have to worry about now? Well, firstly, whilst these rules, uh, those rules I've been referring to have been absolutely instrumental in securing action to reduce toxic pollution, still not enough is being done to comply with those rules. They're still being flouted. So with respect to the ambient air quality limits, um, the UK has been breaching the legal limit for toxic nitrogen dioxide pollution ever since that deadline for compliance passed back in 2010. And the latest reporting figures from government, um, in fact, show that 75% of zones in the UK still clock illegal levels of nitrogen dioxide. And some of you may know that Client Earth has taken three successful legal challenges against the government for these failures in order to force them to act. And this has led to some important progress, but there is clearly still a very long way to go according to these latest figures. Um, and there are still places like Greater Manchester and Sheffield and Newcastle that are still stalling or delaying on action to reduce this harmful pollutant. Um, and when we're looking at the obligations relating to emissions, so the total national emissions, um, projections released by the government last month actually show that the UK is way off track. So um, their current projections show that the 2020 and 2030 emission reduction commitments um, are likely to be missed, and in some cases by as much as 57%, which is huge. Um, so that's quite a big first but. The second but um, is that maintaining the existing legal framework, so even these existing rules um, that have been carried over from the EU really do not go far enough to protect people's health from toxic pollution levels. So the fact is that there is no proven safe level of pollution, we know that, but the World Health Organization does produce kind of guideline concentrations with the view to minimizing the harm to human health caused by certain toxic pollutants. And those guidelines are drawn up on, on, based on a kind of full scale review of all of the existing scientific evidence about the wide range of human health impacts that, um, that air pollution has. Um, and the fact is that the legal limit for one particularly harmful pollutant called fine particulate matter, um, the legal limit that's in law right now is over two times higher than the latest World Health Organization guidelines. And what that means is that the law as it stands, um, whilst we're happy to have it carried over from the EU, it does not actually require action from government to reduce this toxic pollutant, um, even when it remains present at really, really harmful levels. So there are two more buts to come. The third point um, is that as we take back control, we're not only at risk of these existing rules being weakened, uh, but we're also at risk of falling behind progress made in Europe. Now, the regulations I spoke about before saying, you know, these rules are still in place, they're still in domestic legislation, they are secondary pieces of legislation. Now, what this means is that they're much more easy to tinker with <laughs> than an act of parliament. So whilst there's been no explicit suggestion from government that they're going to regress or row back on these existing air quality rules, um, it does remain a glaring risk without any commitment in law not to do so. And at the same time, uh, things are moving forward in Europe. So the ambient air quality directive setting these limit values is currently going through quite a lengthy revamping and improvement process at the EU level. And any progress made there will not frankly have to be followed in the UK um, according to the current rules. And now finally, um, the UK now falls outside of the jurisdiction of the European Commission and the CJU. Now these bodies have played a really important kind of supranational regulator regulatory function. Um, and they have taken, the European Commission has taken enforcement proceedings against the UK 
for their air pollution failures. And it's taken a long, a long time, but they ultimately wield the powerful threat of hefty fines if non-compliance persists and continues. And those shoes right now are left um, noticeably empty. So that is a fair few quite major qualifications to my statement uh, that the pre-existing air pollution rules have been carried over. And these qualifications do make me quite nervous about what's to come. Um, are there any glimmers of hope on the horizon? Well, what is to come? Um, there is a new piece of legislation trundling its way through Parliament um, at the moment, and hopefully many of you um, will be aware of it already, the Environment Bill. Um, and that bill does contain some quite important promises. Um, firstly, it promises new targets for air quality. The bill would commit the Secretary of State to setting a new target for fine particulate matter, pollution, that harmful pollution that I was talking about before, as well as one additional long-term air quality target of their choosing. But these are only two targets. Uh, and these two targets only need to, need to be set uh, by October 2022. And worryingly, there's really nothing of substance in the bill to suggest that these targets will have to improve on those targets that we already have in law when it comes to protecting people's health. The bill sets no real kind of place marker for ambition and includes no mention of human health being the driver for these improvements. And the main delivery mechanism that the bill provides for making sure these targets are actually met on time uh, are referred to in environmental improvement plans. And those plans, the provisions surrounding those plans are pretty vague and unconvincing uh, when compared to the equivalent plans that are required under existing air quality and EU derived law. And this all doesn't leave a huge amount of faith that these targets will be honored uh, once they are set. And secondly, the bill contains promise of a new regulator for public body compliance with environmental law, the Office for Environmental Protection. But um, this bill has been on the table for ages, uh, but there's been huge delays in getting it through Parliament. And the OEP, as a result, doesn't exist yet. And we now therefore have a governance gap. The Commission and the CJU's jurisdiction has fallen away before the OEP has got up and running. Um, and it ex it's expected that the OEP won't be function functioning until autumn or so later this year. And, and Sean will know this, but this will be a subject of a, of a talk all of its own. And there is huge concern uh, that the OEP will lack the powers and the independence to do actually a good job at holding public bodies to account once it is up and running. So that leaves me quite concerned. Maybe you're a bit on edge too now. <laughs> um, what needs to happen to give us a little more comfort that the government will be doing enough uh, to make sure that the air that's going into our lungs is safe to breathe in this new kind of post-Brexit world? Well, firstly, um, the government needs to take its existing legal commitments more seriously. People are still having to breathe what are already illegal levels of nitrogen dioxide in areas across the country. Um, and we know that clean air zones, which are like the ultra low emission zone in London, are the most effective way to, to quickly tackle this problem. Um, so government and local authorities really need to get their act together. Um, and more ambition is clearly needed based on the most re recent um, projections of overall national emissions um, to meet the emission reduction commitments that are already in law. And this is gonna require further action to curb emissions from a whole host of different sources like agriculture, like domestic heating and like industry. Um, secondly, um, for the environment to represent a real step forward with respect to ambition for cleaner air, we need it to include commitment for government to, to strengthen the law to better protect people's health. And that's why we at Client Earth, alongside a whole host of other NGOs, including the British Heart Foundation, the British Lung Foundation, um, have been calling for government to commit to achieving WHO guidelines of fine particulate matter by 2030 at the latest. Um, but unfortunately, so far, the government has been pushing back and saying that it's just too hard. Um, and finally, to make sure that the government stays true to all of this, to the existing rules, as well as any new uh, legal promises to clean up the air, 
we really need a new regulator with the powers and the independence to hold them to account in a meaningful way. And, and right now, the REP would, would fall short, in our opinion. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, hopefully I've got, not gone over by too much. Um, but that's it for me. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, uh, from others on the panel and also from hearing from those of you who have hopefully <laughs> been listening. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. Great introduction. Uh, really helpful. And I should say uh, Client Earth have been tremendously uh, supportive of, of Green UK from, from the beginning and, and really lent their environmental expertise. I, I'm not sure what we'd have done without Client Earth's input. Uh, before, before coming on to Connor, can I just ask one, one question which might be in Connor's presentation? So, and, and apologies if this is an ignorant question, but the UK was responsible for um, uh, abiding by Europe by EU law, um, now that we've left the EU, uh, is your job complicated? Have you now got to hold to account the separate four governments of, of the UK, or is this essentially a, an English problem uh, of breaching the, the air quality limits? Yeah, a good question. Can of worms question. But in simple answer, I think. Um, so the regulations I, I referred to that transfer over the rules from the directive into domestic law, there are four different sets of regulations for the four different devolved, well, for the devolved nations in England. Um, so, and in that context, it's the Secretary of State or equivalent uh, that is responsible. So that is good to some degree. It's not been kind of split up into loads of different pieces. Um, but at the same time, the government has kind of passed the buck to some degree for compliance with these legal limits because it has, in England in any case, ordered a whole host of local authorities to come up with the solutions um, to say, oh, we've been very slow to act so far, but could you actually uh, come up with the solutions and put them in place? And that's why we've seen such huge delays, this kind of passing around of authority and, and of responsibility uh, and passing the buck. Um, so again, I think, I think that's another reason for a really strong regulator to, to, to tackle these kind of cross-cutting systematic issues that might be difficult to kind of chase different authorities around if you're, if you're a claimant or, or trying to bring, bring a judicial review instead. Um. Great, thanks, thanks, Casey. Well, there's a, a lot to get into in your, your talk. And I think the other thing we might want to come on to in the discussion is this whole issue which you raised about secondary legislation becoming more and more important, but also being kind of somewhat under the radar and very hard to track both for parliamentarians and for N NGOs. But um, uh, without further ado, perhaps I can invite uh, Colin to um, uh, tell us about the, what Katie's just described as a can of worms of the, the vulva aspect of the environmental yes. Thank you, good morning. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is the situation across the UK because as has been mentioned, the environment is, an area that's heavily devolved across the, the UK. The UK doesn't just have one legal system, it's got three, three and a half nowadays, if you think about what's happening in Wales. So there is and always has been separate legislation, even before devolution. Since devolution, that position has become more notable. And in Wales in particularly, it's developed a distinct environmental framework since devolution that uh, affects the, the way in which things go forward. When we think about this in relation to Brexit, Brexit has been a major issue as far as devolution is concerned because there have been political disputes over the basic idea of Brexit with majorities in Scotland and Northern Ireland to remain within the EU, major issues over the powers returning from Brussels to the UK, what say if any was London going to have over these matters as opposed to them flowing back to the devolved administrations. How have the devolved administrations been involved in the Brexit negotiations? Answer is very little. And issues about the internal market once within the, the UK, now we've left the EU, say something about that later. And all these tensions have been operating in a situation where there's a general acceptance that the intergovernmental arrangements are fundamentally dysfunctional. Constitutionally, the UK Parliament always has the overriding say on any issue on even in devolved matters, but the mechanisms for the different governments speaking together simply don't work. As has been mentioned with Brexit, the whole 
but the whole mass of EU environmental law disappears. And two particular issues are raised in relation to that. Firstly has been the loss of environmental principles. Environmental principles had legal status it, because they're embedded in the EU treaties. With Brexit, that disappears. And as has been mentioned, the EU also provided important external oversight of government performance, with the Commission checking whether member states were implementing their measures, reporting obligations on various targets, the opportunity for people to complain to the Commission where they thought member states weren't living up to their obligations, and the court having a strong power to compel compliance, as well as there being powerful informal pressure. So losing the principles, losing that oversight was identified as a significant governance gap when Brexit came along and steps have been taken to fill these gaps. But because the environment is a devolved matter, different steps are being taken in different parts of the UK. For England, you have the Environment Bill establishing the Office for Environmental Protection, repeatedly delayed, but its passage is promised for early autumn 2021. And in the meanwhile, there is an interim environmental governance secretariat that's trying to do some of the job to keep to provide a route for people making complaints. In Scotland, we already have legislation, the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Act 2021, which I'll be saying more about. Northern Ireland essentially is to come under the scope of the OAP to be governed by the same set of structures as for England. In Wales, they've decided to delay the formal steps until after the elections next month. But there is, again, an interim environmental protection assessor to provide some mechanisms for it. So we start off by looking at the position in Scotland. Scotland has already passed the Continuity Act 2021, and it does a number of things. It establishes a status for environmental principles. It establishes the new body Environmental Standards Scotland. It commits the government to a review of environmental governance and to an environmental policy strategy. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but it also provides a wide power for the Scottish government, Scottish ministers, to make law to maintain dynamic alignment with the EU, to keep in step with advances in EU law. There's a broad legislative provision giving it power to do that. As far as principles are concerned, the Act creates a legal duty to have due regard to certain environmental principles, the ones that are in the EU treaty, that's integration, the precautionary principle, the preventive principle, principle of rectifying harm at source and the polluter pays principles. And in Scotland, the obligation is to have due regard to the principles themselves as interpreted by the Court of Justice of the EU. That's different from the position, the proposal in England in the Environment Bill, where the obligation is to look at the policy statement made by ministers, not the principles themselves. And the duty to have due regard to the principles applies to ministers in policy formulation and also to all other public authorities in relation to policy formulation where the strategic environmental assessment rules apply. And in Scotland, those rules apply to all policy making, not just the specific categories listed in the EU directive on that. So this, this obligation is much wider than in the rest of the UK. And that again is a clear difference from the proposal in England, the, the, legislative, the, the bill in England, where it's only ministers that are going to have to guard to environmental principles. When it comes to enforcement and oversight, the Act creates a new environmental watchdog, Environmental Standards Scotland. No internally created body can have the same degree of independence, separation from government as the EU bodies outside the UK. But for Environmental Standards Scotland, it's provided that appointments are made by ministers, but they have to be approved by Parliament, and there's no power for ministerial direction to ESS and ministers are meant to seek to ensure they get the resources reasonably sufficient to fulfill its functions. Already questions about whether the allocation is going to be enough, but we'll see as time goes on. Environmental Standards Scotland has to produce a strategy on its functions, how it's going to work with other watchdogs, and it's already starting work on a non-statutory basis. You have the, the link there. 
compared with the proposals for the Office for Environmental Protection for England and Northern Ireland, there's greater independence from government because of this role for Parliament in approving the members. It doesn't have an advisory role to government. It doesn't have a role in monitoring environmental plans, environmental targets, and it has significantly stronger enforcement powers, as I'll say in a moment. So the task of ESS is to monitor compliance with and the effectiveness of environmental law. That includes the implementation of international obligations, but doesn't cover security and finance issues. Also, it cannot consider individual regulatory decisions. It's not meant to be there as another level of appeal, another level of complaint about a particular decision. It's meant to be looking at more strategic, wider issues. And when it finds something's going wrong, it has the power to make an improvement report where there's non-compliance or ineffective implementation of environmental law. The improvement report requires ministers to produce an improvement plan setting out what has to be done, the timescale, arrangements for progress, for review, monitoring of progress. That improvement report, the improvement plan has to be approved by the parliament. If the parliament doesn't like it, doesn't think the ministers are doing enough, they can throw out the plan and require a new one to come forward. So for big systemic issues, you have this option of improvement reports. Where there's non-compliance with the law and a risk of or actual environmental harm, ESS can make a compliance notice against a minister or against any public authority. The recipient can appeal against that to the Sheriff Court, but if it then doesn't comply with the compliance notice, the matter can be referred to the Court of Session, the equivalent of the High Court, where it can be treated as a contempt of court. So non-compliance with a compliance notice is the same as non-compliance with a court order, opening up a whole range of sanctions available to the court. ESS will also have the power to seek judicial review to intervene in legal proceedings. So ESS, Environmental Standards Scotland, set up as a fairly powerful watchdog to keep an eye on what's happening. Other things that the Act is doing in Scotland is requiring the government to carry out a review on the effective and appropriate governance relating to the environment, including in particular access to justice on environmental matters, the Aarhus Convention, big issues across the UK on that issue. And a specific issue to be looked at is whether governance would be enhanced by the establishment of an environmental court. And this review is clearly going to provide a mechanism for dealing not just with the issues that have arisen from Brexit, but with some of the longer standing issues, concerns about environmental governance, environmental protection, the, the mechanisms, access to justice, and so on. And by the time this is being looked at, you may also have developments in relation to human rights in Scotland. There's active discussion on a new human rights framework to include socio and economic rights as opposed to civil and political ones, and those would include a right to a healthy environment. So the whole human rights framework may also come into play here. Also, Scottish ministers obliged to produce an environmental policy strategy, setting out their objectives for protecting and improving the environment, the policies, proposals to reach these monitoring arrangements. But Unlike in England and where England, unlike Northern Ireland, at present there's no suggestion there are going to be legally binding targets on these matters. So a slightly different pattern from what's happening in England, in England particular. So that's Scotland, Northern Ireland. During most of the Brexit period, there wasn't an assembly or executive to decide what to do in relation to the governance gaps that are created. The government executive was reformed, environment formed part of the negotiations towards the reforming of the assembly and the executive, including finally a commitment to establish an environment agency outside a government department, the equivalent of the, e, of the environment agency, natural resources wells, CEPA and Scotland, in Northern Ireland is still part of the government department rather than a separate body. The situation that's been decided on is that Northern Ireland will be covered by the Office for Environmental Protection with similar provisions to England in relation to environmental principles and scrutiny, and it'll have environmental improvement plans similar to those in England. 
in Wales. That's a photograph of Swansea. I'm probably the only person who's ever seen nothing but sunshine anytime I've been in Swansea. I'm told it can rain there. I believe them, but I've never seen it. Wales has done a lot in the environmental area since devolution. It has developed its own environmental governance framework. It merged a wide range of bodies to form natural resources Wales. There's been the Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act with a central obligation on authorities to carry out sustainable development. The Future Generations Commissioner for Wales already exists, some principles already embedded in the law there. In terms of filling the Brexit gaps, formal legislative proposals have been left until after the elections next month, preparatory work continuing, but still not clear exactly what's going to happen. They have appointed an interim environmental protection assessor, and you can see in the quotations there, these are from the, the job advert for the assessor, that this is going to provide a way of reporting, bringing to attention to non-compliance with environmental law, but the operation of the assessor is going to be closely looked at to see what the long-term arrangements are going to be. So we're still quite a long way off seeing arrangements in Wales for dealing with environmental matters after Brexit. Divergence. What though about the issue of how devolution is going to affect the, the way forward? Well, devolution settlements were designed when EU membership was firmly in place. So you didn't need to worry about different parts of the UK doing radically different things on environmental or any other matter. There was some scope for each government to operate separately, but they still had to keep within the limits of EU law. Therefore, there was no need really to think about the proper mechanism for resolving differences. And you had this continuing anomaly problem that the UK government sometimes acts for the whole of the UK, sometimes it acts just for England. So when UK ministers are speaking, it's sometimes quite hard to work out which hat they're wearing and what capacity they're speaking. But we're now in a position where there's a much greater likelihood of divergence. There are clear policy differences arising from Brexit. The UK government's policy is all about taking back control. The UK government deciding to go its own way on environmental and other matters. Scottish government policy is different. It's very much to keep in step with the EU with a wide power to legislate to that effect under the Continuity Act. And Northern Ireland is bound to keep in step with the EU under the Northern Ireland Protocol on many matters. So we've got the real risk of divergence within the UK. Added to that, there's the question of what's going to happen in relation to international commitments in future. International relations are exclusively a power for the UK government. It's the UK government alone that decides whether we're going to do trade deals with the USA, Australia, Japan, North Korea, whoever, and what their terms are going to be. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the agreement between the UK and the EU, has a number of obligations in relation to good regulatory practice, level playing fields, and so on, that affect matters beyond the UK government's direct control because they are devolved matters. And any trade agreement that's made by the UK government using its exclusive power in international relations may well have an impact on devolved matters. So again, there's likely to be tensions arising from that. Divergence has been thought about. The initial way of trying to deal with the risks of divergence was to have a system of common frameworks that all the governments would agree on common policy in certain areas where it was important to have a common policy across the UK. The governments would agree on this, they'd then implement them separately. So you'd have the same result across the whole UK, but each administration would still have made its own laws respecting the devolution settlement. Last year, though, a different solution has been put forward through and legislated for through the United Kingdom Single Market Act 2020, which was passed without consent from the devolved parliaments, and it asserts the market access and non-discrimination principles. What does that matter? What does that mean in terms of environmental issues? Well, it means that it allows goods lawfully sold in any part of the UK access to the markets in all other parts. <coughs> So that if one part of the UK, let's say England, decides on deregulation in terms of environmental standards, 
Scotland cannot insist on only goods meeting its own higher standards being available. So there's a, a race to the bottom. Whenever one part of the UK introduces lower standards, the others can't stop those goods being distributed more widely. And the economic reality, of course, is that England dominates the market. So that in effect, the decisions taken in England will dictate the position even in devolved areas. If England decides on a new standard, that's going to be de facto the situation because England has 80 plus percent of the UK economy. So whereas the initial response to, devolution, to di possible divergence was the commonly agreed frameworks, you now have the Single Market Act that allows any one part, de facto England, to dominate the position. So in terms of the future, things are still far from settled. There are significant formal steps to be completed to put in place the new environmental governance frameworks. The European Parliament has still to ratify the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. We could be back to a no Brexit deal if they really decided to get awkward. We have to see the enactment of the Environment Bill at Westminster. We have still to see what's going to be happening in Wales. We still don't know what's going to happen in terms of the level playing field and non-regression arrangements in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. How are the devolved administrations going to have a voice in the various committees, the structures? What arrangements is the UK government going to put in place to enable it to meet its obligations, the obligations it's signed up to, that actually affect areas it doesn't directly control in terms of policy making and so on? We still don't know what policy directions are going to be taken, particularly in England. You have this dichotomy, this mismatch between the great environmental rhetoric, but also the opening up for business rhetoric, the, how those are going to balance, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in relation to future trade deals. We don't know what's going to happen in relation to the political tensions between the devolved administrations and the UK government over all sorts of things, obviously very much up in the air in the current election. So that's a very, very quick run through some of the issues that are raised by devolution, some of the different responses to Brexit that are being implemented uh, across the country. Just now, I'll be happy to deal with questions in due course. Ray, thanks, Colin. Really rich run through. Before, before turning to Tom, can I just ask you uh, I mean, a, a, a difficult question with hopefully a reasonably short answer is whether you're confident that the, the, the legal protections that are being put in place in the devolved administrations will be proof against the, the kind of political imbalance, the dominance of England within the UK, the fact that the Department of International Trade uh, isn't really consulting let, the UK Parliament, let alone devolved parliaments about trade deals. Uh, the fact that within the UK government, there doesn't seem to be a huge awareness of, of these devolved aspects. Do you, do you think politics will, will kind of triumph or can law um, in, in, the, in the devolved administrations serve its purpose and, and, and uh, protect the environment? Well, I think largely it, that issue is a, a politics one and the, the legal position is that the UK Parliament can walk over the devolved administrations if it wants to. So it is a source of huge frustration in the devolved administrations that they're not listened to, they're not even informed of things. I mean, that's partly been because the UK government itself has been so dysfunctional over the last few years over over Brexit, but there's no, at the last time I was speaking to people involved, there was still no sign of how the devolved administrations are going to be involved in all the structures which the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the, and the EU cre created. There's no formal place, legally guaranteed place for the devolved administrations and precious little sign that, all, that has even been thought about how they're going to get in and that is for the Scottish Parliament, Scottish government ministers, a real worry that the devolution settlement is going to get un unraveled. Then you're, you're taking steps backwards with more power being exercised in London. Great, thanks, thanks, Colin. Lots to get our teeth into. A reminder to everybody that uh, to put questions in the the Q and A function um, on on your screens. But there's probably nobody better placed to talk about the politics and the environment uh, than than Tom Burke. So, Tom. Uh, um, your, your 15, 20 minutes now, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sean. Um, 
it's 50 years um, since uh, I joined a local group of Friends of the Earth. You talked about my long CV. It goes back that far. Um, uh, so I started as an environmentalist. And in a sense, what I'm going to do a bit is step back uh, and look at both some of the failures that Catherine outlined and the tensions we've just heard about from Colin in a wider context of the development of uh, uh, politics and policy on the environment uh, over that sort of period. Uh, when, when I started the environmental campaigning 50 years ago, the, the challenge really was to extend the rule of law over what was then a completely uncolonized wild frontier uh, of the environment. There was no Department of the Environment. There was no government policy on the environment. You couldn't look up environmental law in a library. There were no environmental lawyers. Uh, indeed, there were no really no environmental professionals of any kind. So we really have come somewhere since then. There is an environment department. The government has a 25 year environment plan, though it's not yet, it's not published a formal statement of its environment policy since 1990. There are a large number of environmental laws in the statute book coming, as we've heard, under quite a lot of strain. Uh, and we party to a large number of international treaties. There's a vast legion now of environmental professionals. Uh, and of course, there are several battalions of environmental lawyers. So in a way, the challenge has turned around. The post-Brexit challenge for the environment is for environmental campaigners and environmental professionals to work out how best to protect the rule of law from the politics of Brexit that we've just begun to hear uh, some of explained. And, and we've seen a rising drumbeat of media story about this government's failures. Catherine talked about air pollution, uh, but that's only one of the areas where government has, has consistently failed. Uh, and that drumbeat is likely to get louder as uh, the drive to rebuild uh, the economy, post-pandemic economy accelerates. And there's more pressure uh, brought to bear in the environment. Uh, now, politics, in, in one sense, is simply the art of making choices together. And law is how we encode the more enduring of those choices in, in text or statute. Environmental law, if you like, is how we balance one person's freedom to drive their car against a mother's freedom from anxiety about her child's health, the freedom of some people to burn fossil fuels against the freedom of other people from wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. So in a way, uh, today's question about what Brexit has done for environmental law is more than simply about what's in the text. It's about what happens uh, uh, to people. Uh, and so what matters most to those people, and as well as to the environment, are the outcomes the law promises, and if it's properly enforced, actually delivers. So if you like, in some sense, the question we're asking, paraphrasing that famous line from uh, Monty Python, is what did EU law, environmental law, what's the EU environmental law done for us? Well, the past, as they say, is a foreign country, and we easily forget how things used to be. And that's as true of environmental law as it is of a city street. So here are some of the things, just to remind us, that the EU we used to take for granted in protecting the environment uh, across the United Kingdom. Regular environmental action programs produced every five or six years that set out a forward-looking and evidence-based agenda for the future development of environmental policy and law. As we learned more about what human activities were doing to the environment, so issues were added to that agenda and discussion began about the appropriate policy and legal response. This made it possible for business and civil society organizations to plan strategically to get engaged in that process of development. And by the way, that for all its frustrating uh, operational practices and time it took, it was fantastically transparent compared to the, and accessible to everybody who wanted to get involved compared to the way our British uh, policymaking is conducted. So it also offered a clear sense of direction of travel of policy development, which then allowed potentially affected parties the time and confidence to invest in innovative approaches to environmental solutions. So you could harness not just the constraining power of the law, but also the creative power 
of uh, innovation, of investment, uh, because you had that forward-looking perspective. But the publication of our common inheritance in 1990 was Britain's first comprehensive statement of policy on the environment that offered that kind of guidance uh, at uh, business and civil society. In the 27 years since then, there's been no publication of a UK framework uh, such as that. Instead, what we've had is a succession of governments whose attention to environmental policy has probably best been described as intermittent. On occasion, there have been outbursts of arbitrary and rapid policy changes, which destructive to both business and civil society confidence, quite often driven not by uh, evidence and not by real things, simply driven by headlines. And sometimes they've produced action on things like plastic straws, and sometimes they've defeated action like a lot of things on uh, energy policy. Uh, but that loss of regulatory stability is also going to be accompanied by an increase in the cost of regulation. The UK is now going to have to mirror a whole number of European agencies whose costs are currently shared with 27 other countries. That's going to matter most of all uh, with the chemical industry as we try to create some sort of equivalent of the European chemical, uh, Chemicals Agency to decide what chemicals are safe enough to be marketed in. Um, so difficulties already appearing uh, just on one major issue that the EU used to do for us, but the second one, and there are lots more without getting in, but the second really big one was the fact that the EU had a powerful mechanism for the enforcement of environmental legislation and therefore for the achievement of environmental goals. The prospect of appearing before the European Court of Justice was a compelling incentive on member states to comply with the requirements of environmental law. And that was a mechanism that backed the power of persuasion with the prospect of sanction. It worked for the most part without the sanctions. It worked flexibly and efficiently and encouraged settlements. But the ability of the court to resort to sanctions was a fierce discipline on member states' factual behavior. Uh, and the UK found that out to its cost when a failure to properly transpose the nitrates directive in Northern Ireland led to infraction proceedings under the European Commission, getting to the point just before they went to the court to ward off what might have been daily fines that could have amounted to hundreds of millions of pounds. The government suddenly launched a crash program to, uh, which cost about 240 billion to bring Northern Ireland into compliance. So you can imagine what might have happened if some of the problems that Catherine was talking about had actually got to the stage of going before the court if we'd had to actually do something about air pollution instead of prevaricating as we've done. Now, I don't mean that was a mechanism that always worked very well. I'm a lifelong bird watcher and the failure of the EU to properly enforce its legislation and the protection of migratory birds has long been a source of great frustration. But at least when we were inside the EU, we were able to press harder for better enforcement to protect our birds from the depredations of Southern European hunters. Well, we're out now. Uh, Brexit's done. We have regained our sovereignty. <laughs> I have to say, as our fishermen have already discovered, we've not got our fish back. Um, uh, what now for environmental law in Britain? The promises are still there. To be the greenest government ever, to leave a better environment than it inherited. We were repeatedly told that environmental standards will not be allowed to fall now that we're out of the EU. But it's very striking how in the uh, debate on the bill in the House, the government refused amendments that would have enshrined that promise in law. Uh, these are proud boasts. They're going to take some work. But while we've clearly seen some improvements in some aspects of Britain environment, uh, and a lot of greenish headlines, you would need to search very hard indeed to find convincing evidence that taken as a whole, the environment is better now than it was 10 years ago. So the promise the government can only be fulfilled if our own British environmental law can actually deliver better outcomes than were being delivered by EU law before Brexit. Now, putative generals, when they attend staff college, are instructed not to pay attention to uh, opponents' intentions, but to his capabilities. And there is no doubt about the government's environmental intentions. I'm slightly reminded of that 
John from the 60s, I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Please don't let me be misunderstood. But what about its post-Brexit environmental capabilities? We've somehow managed to arrive at an extraordinary paradox. Our environment is under increasingly visible stress. The public is more aware than ever of that stress and more supportive of vigorous action to reduce it. Yet our machinery for managing the environment is weaker now than it was in the last century. A few recent headlines define that point. I read in one, natural England, cut to the bone and unable to protect wildlife, says staff. Very next day, DEFRA lacking clear plan for meeting environmental goals, watchdog warns. But just this morning, I read UK's native woodlands reaching crisis point. None of those headlines were a surprise to anybody who's been involved in environmental policy and law uh, at all. We no longer have a Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution. We no longer have a Sustainable Development Commission. We no longer have a powerful Department of the Environment. GEFRA became and has largely remained an annex of the Agriculture Department. The planning system in Britain has been so degraded that it is now little more than an advisor to developers. Neither Natural England nor the Environment Agency retain genuine independence of government. Both have had their budgets cut to the bone and their ability to perform their role as statutory advisors chilled. The government's environmental intentions are burgeoning just as its capabilities are in steep decline. This is not a prescription for the success of either environmental policy or environmental law in post-Brexit Britain. And as we've heard, much of the burden of delivering an environment that matches government's intentions will fall on the soon to be Office of Environmental Protection. I can't say that this proposal fills me with confidence. It's only recourse to uh, sanction failures, sanction failures by the government to obey its own laws seems to be judicial review. Well, this isn't the moment to rehearse the sorry history of judicial review as a whole. Let me simply point out that it's the very process that the government is currently promising out of the other side of its mouth to weaken. So I think I'm going to be looking for a lot of other developments before I believe there is anything more than a torrent of green headlines to be expected. One of the things we're not short of in Britain is the good science and administrative skills to develop an environmental policy and its implementing law to see us safely through the stresses of the 21st century. But they have little value without the political will to use them. The problem with political will is that it is, uh, is as ephemeral as yesterday's headlines. So it needs to be reinforced by a stronger institutional framework. Interesting to see how much better that's been recognized in Scotland than it has been uh, uh, in England. Uh, and here are some of the elements of such a framework that would certainly build my confidence that the future of environmental policy and law in post-Brexit Britain is secure. Some of bit of this will sound familiar to what Colin was saying. An Office of Environmental Protection with the power to impose fines on ministers whose departments are found to be in breach of their legal obligations. A reconvened Royal Commission of the Environment to look systematically at the full range of future environmental challenges. An Environmental Audit Committee of Parliament with similar staff and powers to that of the Public Accounts Committee to create effective parliamentary oversight of the government's delivery of its environmental promises. Full restoration of the independence of the Environment Agency in National England, neither of which now have their own websites. Uh, it, uh, with Parliament rather than government setting their budgets and a requirement for an office of budgetary, for the Office of Budgetary Responsibility to conduct an annual audit of the consistency of public spending plans with the government's environmental objectives. You only have to look at the contrast between what the government is going to spend on the issue it's telling us frequently is the most important issue uh, that on the environment facing it now, climate change. When you looked at the last budget and compared what it was spending to do with climate change, the 27 billion it was going to spend on roads, you got a pretty fair idea of why maybe you'd need to have somebody like the Office of Budget Responsibility 
uh, paying attention to that sort of detail. I simply think that people of Britain want an environment policy that they can have confidence is capable of meeting the challenges of the future. I've set out some of the things I think to meet that. I was really interested to see the extent to which some of them have been picked up in the devolved administration. I would have thought if you were the SNP, you would now be very busily promoting the environment as another reason why Scotland would want to leave England. Thanks. Great, thank you, Tom. Very enlightening, if not uh, wholly cheering. Uh, and I, I thought your point was particularly useful that the government, the UK government's environmental intentions are burgeoning just as its capabilities are in steep decline. Um, can I, before moving to the sort of panel discussion, I, I think you and I sort of shared the view that leaving the European Union was going to be a bad thing for the environment, and um, we, we've got a lot of ground to make up. Uh, can I just put to you the argument that's been made by quite a lot of people, I mean, Jill Rutter from the Institute for Government, for instance, which is that over the years, the UK environmental movement kind of uh, focused on getting changes in Brussels, which it knew it could get, legal changes, and sometimes neglected winning hearts and minds politically, domestically in the UK, and that actually leaving will give us the opportunity to sort of entrench changes which are, as it were, politically owned rather than legally imposed on on ministers. Do you have, have any hope uh, in that sense? I, I think Jill, Jill has part of the story right, uh, which is that the, the environmental NGOs in, in effect became much better at lobbying than at grassroots campaigning. And I, that remains a problem for the environmental NGOs in Britain. Uh, I don't think she's right uh, about that. I think it's a nice hope that Jill has, uh, uh, that somehow it's going to get better. But I have a reason for that. I, my sense is that quite a lot of the collapse of uh, real political commitment on the environment in Britain, particularly by the Conservatives, has been, that, uh, has been the importation largely from America of quite a lot of political philosophy that says we can't possibly win an argument against the environment and all that that entails. But what we can do is a whole series of things that take away the capability to deliver. So you don't change environmental law because that would be unpopular. You just do what Francis Ford was proposing to uh, uh, right at the beginning of in 2010. And that is you give yourself in secondary legislation the power to get rid of any public body you chose. So you wouldn't change the law, you'd simply get rid of Natural England and, and the Environment Agency. Uh, so you gut the law. And I think there's quite a lot of that going on. What's happened to the planning system has gone on. You will know this better than anybody should. What's happened to the planning system has been a sustained assault on its ability to balance conflicting economic interests, which has largely gone unnoticed and uncommented on, both by the NGO community as a whole and by the British media. So I, I think, and I think there's a political project in that. I don't think it's simply an accident. That's why I don't share... Um, a Jill's hope. Thanks, Tom. And I'm, I'm going to invite all the panelists to sort of wave at me if they want to come in and respond to any points that have been made by the others, so we can have a a, a free flowing discussion. But but Casey, on on the point that Tom Tom's making about kind of below the environmental law won't be weakened, but the ability to enforce it will, and a lot of stuff will be snuck through by second legislation and and so on. But could you sort of comment? Do, do you see a busier time for client earth and similar bodies ahead? Just kind of keeping up with what's what's going on. And then I might invite Colin just to talk about the Scottish and the devolved uh, aspects of that as well, because there's also a lot of secondary legislation across the, the UK. Katie. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll be kept busy. <laughs> um, you're right. Um, I think in the context of secondary legislation, I mean, of, often that type of legislation includes like very technical details around, you know, how things are measured, or how things are reported or exactly what type of things plans have to contain. And whilst those might seem like pernickety detail, they are really, really key to back up the kind of overarching commitments that are made. And, and we see that in the air quality context. You know, the rules around where you put your monitors and how you measure pollution levels are absolutely critical um, to establishing how those limits actually protect people. Because if, if, if the monitors don't have to be placed, you know, 
where pollution is going to be at its highest or whether they, they could just be plonked in like background locations uh, with a view to kind of just getting a general sense of background pollution. That's not really going to help people who live alongside a road, for example. So I think, you know, these really technical aspects, which might go under the radar um, behind high level commitments for uh, with respect to like a number at the front of a target, for example, I think there's a real risk in those kind of things going through secondary legislation without people noticing. And, and I think that's a job for people like Klarna to try and notice those sneaky things. I mean, like Colin was saying as well, um, the kind of reporting requirements have, have now changed kind of through secondary legislation as a result of Brexit. So that kind of pulling that regulatory, that kind of oversight function away from certain really, really important parts of legislation without something to replace it is really, really worrying but again, is something that's kind of hidden within the technical detail of, of a piece of secondary legislation. Um, so there is, yeah, I, I think I think there is a risk of, of things being weakened through the back door almost. Thanks, Katie. And just before I come to, back to Colin, what, there's a question in the uh, from a, um, an attendee um, about uh, to what extent are the UK's international obligations relevant in substituting standards kept by the EU. So it's quite often UK government ministers will say, well, this wasn't an EU um, responsibility anyway, it's an international law, we'll have to follow it anyway. Can you just explain why sort of EU law bites more or bit more than uh, international law in many cases? I'm oh, sorry, is that one for me as well? Yeah, well, um, or, or, yes, if, if I, 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 yes. The simple answer is that the international obligations tend to be more vaguely phrased and they don't have the same strict enforcement mechanism that there was within the EU. So it's a, it's a difference between a sort of almost an aspiration and hard, tight law that can be enforced. Yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, it, it often relies on it being embarrassing not to comply uh, from an international point of view, rather than actually your hard hitting consequences. So, you know, the CJU, for example, has taken infringement proceedings against the UK's failure on these air quality obligations. Um, and what could have resulted in that from that is huge, like millions and millions of euros of fines. Um, that's not going to happen on the international scale. Um, thanks. Uh, Tom. Yeah, there's a deeper point here, um, which gets very confused. A lot of people get very confused about with in relation to climate change. It, international treaties are political agreements. They do not have enforcement mechanisms. They're not supposed to have enforcement mechanisms. They are not. They are simply agreements to do something. EU law was law. It was. A, it was an explicit and uh, deliberate surrendering of sovereignty, uh, sharing of sovereignty rather than surrendering of sovereignty. And law is, law is, it, it, is, is quite is precise and is enforceable. So it's very difficult to ask the question, how would you enforce a climate change treaty? The obvious, you know, it, you're not going to try and enforce it. How do you enforce EU law? By sanctions and specifically by EU fines of breaches of environmental law were daily fines that were unlimited if you remained in breach. So there's a real difference between what we've given up and what we're going to replace it with in terms of our relationship with uh, other countries. Thanks. But I think that's really clear and really important to keep hammering home that point because we're quite often told, well, you know, we, we can do things better. It's international anyway, etc. But the EU was a particular had a particular bite when it when it uh, set a, a law. Um, Colin, do you want to just address this question about kind of stuff uh, going under the radar and, the, and particularly the role of secondary legislation in, in Scotland and perhaps the other devolves? Yeah, I think there's before getting to that, there's another aspect of stuff going under the radar, which is that the tradition in UK administrative systems has been to allow a lot of discretion for the deciding bodies. So it's possible, without changing the actual legal framework, to see a quite a heavy erosion of environmental protection, simply because the discretion always gets exercised in favour of development industry rather than in favour of nature. If you take do you need an environmental impact assessment? Well, there are certain judgments. Is it, a, is it having a significant effect on this? Well, if you keep 
deciding, no, it doesn't have a significant effect. The law legal framework stays the same, but the impact of it is, is very different. So as well as the problem of erosion through technical changes, you've got that problem as well. In terms of secondary legislation, the this is going to cut. Sorry, Colin. Sorry, Tom. This is going to come into very sharp focus when you look at how the Habitats Directive and SPAs are going to work, maintaining the standards that they provided as you develop free ports. I think there's going to be a head on collision between the aspiration to maintain standards and the ability to deliver free ports which will bring up, as Colin was saying, bring this sort of issue right up front into the public uh, eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going back to the secondary legislation point, it's the same issue across the administrations, but perhaps with the two differences that, particularly in the smaller jurisdictions, Wales and Northern Ireland, is there the capacity within government to make to draft all this and is yeah. there the capacity within the NGO the wider community actually to scrutinize the expertise to scrutinize it I mean there's a huge problem there in terms of of scale which the you know is a, is a real challenge especially when the the mechanisms for cooperation and collaboration aren't working all that well yeah, no, I, I should say Green UK has a, um, an SI hub for UK um, statutory instruments, which is working really well, but is dependent on just a couple of people, really, uh, including from Client Earth and Friends of the Earth. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't say that we are brilliantly resourced and nor are parliamentarians, and they're quite often uh, relying on our, our advice, particularly on DEFRA SIs, but there are SIs from other departments, which is going under the radar totally at the moment. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions. I don't know who wants to take them, but a couple of questions in the chat about the uh, Office for Environmental Protection and what can be done to strengthen its um, independence. Uh, um, uh, this, I know, will be picked up in, in the workshop this afternoon. But does anybody want to um, uh, lead on the OEP? Colin, why don't you have a go? Because yeah, it, it might be useful just to compare it. Yeah. With it's got to be recognised that you cannot create internally within the UK, within any, any jurisdiction of the UK, a body that is as independent, as powerful as the external EU bodies were. So you're never going to achieve the same level of that. So you're looking at how you create a body that will operate independently of, of government. Now, to a large extent, that's actually a cultural, political issue, because some of the bodies like the Ombudsman and so on, they're, when you analyse their their raw legal structure, you could see it working in a way that wasn't very independent of government, but because it's been respected, all the parties accept that they will and should operate independently, that largely get largely gets gets respected. But there are a number of things you can do to make things make things better. The fact that the OEP is going to be just ministerial appointment without the parliament having any say in it is an obvious thing to do the fact that the bill currently allows for ministerial direction on some of the policy, some of the operational aspect is again, clearly an issue. Some sort of guarantee of, financial, of the finances of the resources. Though again, that's always hugely, hugely difficult. So it's, it's as much mindset and culture, but there are some obvious flaws in the legal setup for OEP, which ESS is, is better on we look forward to seeing what Wales manages to do in due course. And OEP, the, the, the extent to which Northern Ireland has an input into the OEP appointment and so on, I mean, to me, that just seemed astonishingly lax and weak in terms of protecting Northern Ireland interests. Thanks, Colin. I don't know if anybody else wants to, to come on on that, Tom, you yeah. yeah. Just one, yeah, one point. I, there was an obvious point that was um, amongst others, uh, uh, proposed by a former uh, comptroller, uh, former head of the uh, uh, NAO, which was you give you have to give it Parliament control of its budget, not the department. Because if you have a department in control of its budget, you can hide, the, which is what's happened with Natural England and the Environment Agency, you can conceal the fact that you are um, 
uh, basically eliminating its powers to do things simply by having the departmental budget constrained. And then that's an internal fight inside the department, not a public fight about what should be the right budget. If Parliament sets the budget, then you can change it by all means as a government. But you have to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right now, it can get away with constraining all, all of the environmental agencies simply by, which are funded out of the departments, simply by constraining the departmental and burying the issue. And that's, that's one step. If you wanted to build confidence in the OEP, that's the step you would take to build confidence. As it is, you know, I think it's going to have a very difficult job uh, actually meeting the expectations that have been built up around what it can do because of all those constraints. And that continues to poison the atmosphere in which environmental regulation is, is absolutely no good for uh, the environment, but is also no good for business. Business wants regulatory certainty. It does not want the kind of uncertainty that failure to make the OEP effective instrument uh, of policy enforcement will uh, uh, accomplish. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the depressing things about the OEP setup is that the government has fallen into the trap of all governments of, of thinking that it's going to be around forever and it's not setting up a, a, a really robust um, oversight body that will hold other governments to account when when it's no longer in, in power. It's, uh, it's been quite short-sighted in that. In, in that I, I should say, uh, just as a point of sort of not as gloomy as you thought I was being. Look, I, I'm struck by the fact that the person they've appointed to deal with it was able to get the government to reverse a very bad policy on the probation service. So I don't think they're trying to load it up by the appointment that's been made as the putative head. So it will be a structural failure, not necessarily a failure of, of the people, uh, a weakness in the overall structure. Uh, and that's a bit that government can correct. It is, though we were always reasonably confident that it would be set up with a credible first chair, which it has been, and, and, and hopefully good commissioners. It's in five years' time when it's below the radar, out of sight. That's what we're really worried about. Um, but you're uh, absolutely uh, right. Uh, uh, Colin, and then I've got a question for Katie. And then just again, on the positive side, if you think back to what was actually being talked about at the time of the referendum, when everything was about deregulation, the fact we've got anything, is actually something to be welcomed at the yeah. time of the referendum the you know those just this talk about getting rid of all the environmental stuff the judicial review would do everything the fact we have got something even if it's not as good as we might like is still to be welcomed and I know that Colin was probably trying to end on a good note but just to bring it, bring it back again to reiterate one of the points that Tom made in his presentation about the fact that the OEP is still essentially hamstrung by the limitations of judicial review um, still with respect to what it can do and what it can bring in front of the courts. And then it's additionally hamstrung by a specific clause within the bill uh, relating to the remedies that the court can apply in, the con in, in response to an environmental review challenge. And the fact that those remedies can't, I can't remember the words exactly, but you know, materially um, impact a third party. And, and that has huge implications for, for example, planning decisions and the inability to reverse or quash a planning decision. Um, and so again, it's the technical detail in there is like even further hamstrung the OEP in the context of judicial review, which is already very limited in what it can achieve. Uh, to, uh, Tom, then I'm gonna come on to air quality, Tom. Yeah, I was just gonna follow up because Catherine's drawn attention to something that's really important. I made a kind of short reference to the denaturing of degradation of the of the planning system but the planning system was the device we had for preemptively dealing with problems rather than having to regulate the back end of them you could use the planning system to plan them out that was the point of environmental impact assessment legislation and so on and what we've got is a government that basically has taken a series of steps to remove planning as any kind of constraint on what's done so there's no real capacity now to deal, for instance, with cumulative impacts of things. You know, there's nominal, it's nominally still there, but in reality, that ability to look at what's happening to the environment as a whole is being consistently undermined by these decisions on, on planning, this weakening of the planning system. 
as well as the ability of citizens, of ordinary voters, to get some sort of say about what happens to their environment. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll resist the temptation to get started on, on planning, Tom, but you're, you're entirely right. And I think you mentioned free ports earlier. It is, I think, significant that one of the advantages of free ports is, is perceived as being that you can just strip away all planning, planning controls rather right. than think of planning as, as the way of getting good, high quality development, business certainty and, 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 and so on. Um, but um, if, I, if I may just put a couple of questions um, now to... I think you've muted I, yourself, Sean. I, I, I muted, I, I muted, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, I won't repeat yeah, it. No, I've, I've, I'm sorry, I've switched it off. Apologies. <laughs> um, Catherine, you're muted. You muted me, did you, Tom? That's, uh, um, no, 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 I didn't. I can't <laughs> do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Casey, I was going to ask a question here. Is How is it possible that the UK is missing its air quality targets so substantially? Are they not legally binding? And what can be done to hold governments more strictly to account for environmental targets? Which I guess is sort of underlining this. Is, is if the law is, is so good and such a good mechanism, why does Planet Earth keep having to go to court again and again and again? Yeah, it's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice to work on something different for a bit, <laughs> but unfortunately, they're still they're still breaching these legal limits. I think it is a it has been a long run, running battle. Um, in terms to kind of like step back uh, with respect to where the problem is coming from, nitrogen dioxide principally comes from vehicle emissions, so from the stuff coming out of tailpipes of cars, lorries, buses, um, and diesel vehicles in particular. So obviously the Dieselgate scandal has had a huge role to play in kind of causing the problem in the first place. It's not an excuse for the government to still be flouting the rules, but in terms of where this is kind of stemmed from, um, that is some explainer. And it also is important to highlight what needs to be done to tackle that. Um, so it's evident that people need help to move away from the most polluting vehicles uh, to cleaner alternatives. We know that we've got millions of grossly polluting diesel vehicles still on the roads people need to be able to do away with them um, and also to restrict the most polluting vehicles so that's where clean air zones come in like things like the ultra low emission zone and i think what our legal action has achieved is it has required government to come up with a plan <laughs> to put these kind of schemes these kind of effective schemes in place and they do have that plan which is a good thing but evidently the problem is, is that the process of getting these schemes up and running has been beset with huge delays. Um, and that is quite hard to challenge. So, I mean, that's something where judicial review is, is a difficult thing to use to, to, to counter these kind of like eking delays to action, kind of promises being made and then slightly missed and then so on and so on. COVID coming in as well in the interim has not helped, obviously. Um, and I think that kind of leads back to what does legally binding actually mean <laughs> as well. People kind of swing that term around a lot as like the solution. But ultimately you can have a commitment in law and if you don't have that, that commitment is only ever as good as the tools that you can use to enforce against it. And that's where the OEP comes in, but that's also where like the delivery mechanism within any piece of legislation is really crucial. Um, and that's what I'm concerned about with respect to the environment bill as well. You, the bill may well come lead to ambitious targets being set, but isn't, if there isn't a really clear and robust kind of plan making mechanism that sits underneath those targets, it'll be very hard to hold government to account because you're never going to have a court order the government to comply with a target. It's only ever really probably going to order the government to come up with a plan to comply with the target within a certain period of time. Um, given the kind of complexities of these national level kind of targets. Um, so I think that's a nuance that of, often gets lost, like people say legally binding, but what does that actually mean? And I think the, the example of air pollution is a really good one to show that, you know, you can have these legally binding targets in place, but you need a robust mechanism to back them up, to make sure that you have the tools to hold government to account against them. And we've been able to do that to some degree, but there's certainly more to go. Uh, and it highlights improvements that can be made in legislation going forward as well. Okay, so the law, the mechanisms and, and the politics all need to be uh, aligned, I guess. Uh, one more question for you, and I'm going to ask uh, concluding questions for 
each panel panel member. So uh, I don't know if it's for you or, or or Tom or Colin, but there's a question in in the Q and A about whether the new uh, UK emissions trading scheme can be a litmus test for creating higher environmental standards in, in the UK. How what do people feel about about that? Tom, you're muted, Tom, but. Uh, Tom, you're still muted. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, <laughs> uh, it could be. I mean, the emission trading scheme works on the basis that you keep you keep taking out credits in order to force the price up to create the economic incentive. Well, if you look at the government's performance on the vehicle fuel duty escalator, which I think is now more than a decade since it was increased when the, the whole of that idea was to exactly the same with vehicle fuels to provide more efficient uh, vehicles and what that simply happens the government simply didn't up the stakes what do i think the government will do i think the, the, the commission to be fair, the eu has been pretty bad at using the emission trading scheme to drop to do what it was supposed to do which was to drive progressive lowering of the amount of credits available been really weak on that front. It's been a long, torturous process to try to improve the system uh, so that it would actually create a, a fiscal incentive, a tax incentive in effect. Um, frankly, I don't see this government doing that. I mean, that's a political judgment. Could it do it? Yes, it could. So if they don't, you're getting another indicator of the difference that, in a sense, the kind of thing Catherine was talking about, the difference in the intention and the actuality of of, of, of performance delivery. Great, thanks. So let me let me finish with a really unfair quick fire question to um, to, to each of you, Colin, Catherine, Tom. T Tom set out his the, the uh, a modest um, manifesto of what he thinks needs to to happen. Uh, um, what what would be your sort of top changes that we need to make so that the uh, actuality can catch up with the good intentions. What, what sort of legal or political changes, Colin? And and then in a word, are you optimistic or not that in five years' time we'll be looking at a stronger, stronger environmental protections, both in Scotland I'm, and across the UK? I think I'm pessimistic because what you really need is a willingness to rethink business as usual. So many of the problems we face just now, you can deal with individual little bits and pieces, but they all stem back to uh, an unsustainable, climate-destroying business as usual. And you've really got to think about some of that underlying causes, not just the level of emissions from vehicles, but why, why is the travel taking place in the first place? Well, that is getting beyond, getting to that lower level we really need to think about. And there's precious little sign of that happening, especially with the priority is going to be given to recovery from COVID. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Katie, are you going to cheer us up? I, sorry, no, from, <laughs> probably not. I think, I mean, firstly, the government, with respect to air pollution, has got to get its house in order um, in the context of existing legal commitments before it starts um, promising even more, because those promises seem quite unconvincing if it can't quite meet the existing legal obligations that ha it has in law. Um, and then secondly, I think um, the Environment Bill is a great opportunity for the government to set out its, its stall for improving air quality going forward. Um, I mentioned this legal limit for part fine particulate matter, which is two times higher than the World Health Organization recommends. The Environment Bill provides a great opportunity for the government to commit to achieving those World Health Organization guidelines um, by 2030. Um, I think we're relatively realistic about the kind of changes that might be able to be made through the Environment Bill, given the political arithmetic that exists and the unwillingness of government to kind of consider amendments that have been put forward to date. So, I mean, that's a relatively narrow and I think reasonable ask to make of government. Um, so that's what we're leading with at the moment. Um, and then after the Environment Bill, um, yeah, there's certainly many ways that we can ask the UK to improve the um, air quality framework, but I, I'm not gonna go into that right now. WHA by 2030 is our kind of priority right now. Thanks, and finally, Tom, the, you, you talked about your 50 years of experience. The, the environment must have a higher profile now 
across the world than it's had for much of that time, not least because the evidence of the scrap pack with screwing it up is becoming absolutely inescapable to everyone. But um, can, can uh, practice catch up with good intentions? Can it? Yes. Will it? Uh, the thing, it, it certainly won't without much more active government. That's the first thing. And a better balance between freedom from and freedom to, because generally we're much more interested politically in freedom to than we are in freedom from, as we're seeing on the debate over the politics of the virus. So the, the bits of government that are really good in my mind, and we forget there are two bits. There's a political bit and an administrative bit. The administrative bit of government is pretty good. I've got a lot of confidence in the administrative bit of government. I have increasingly less confidence in the political bit of government. And so my one ask is for proportional representation. So we break up the hegemony of the existing political parties really fundamentally, uh, because I think that is it's the politics that are the problem, not the technology, not the economics. Uh, not the administration, it's the politics. So we have to get politics that's more responsive to that desire by the people to respond, public and voters to respond to actual the challenges they're experiencing. Great, thank you. Well, we're out of time. A really, really interesting session. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to those who listened in and um, put, put questions in the chat. Uh, there's There are Great sessions this afternoon, including a real chance to interrogate what's happening with the Office of Environmental Protection uh, this afternoon. So uh, I hope people will join those sessions. Um, but that's it for now. Thanks all very much indeed.